Uh, good morning to all of you. Four of you in the audience today. Thrilling. I guess all getting all those homeworks at like 4 a.m. in the morning from everybody. A little suspicious. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you four for coming today to your favorite class. Uh, just want to say a couple things. Uh, we only have a little bit left of the class, all right? So good job, everybody sticking in and, and sticking through. We're near the end. Homework seven coming. Going to be on woven composites and sandwich composites, kind of the last topic for the class. Uh, and then you got your final exam. I'll put a final exam study guide out probably late next week, something like that. All right. So not a lot left for the class. I've uh, been proud of you guys how well you've done so far. Uh, so keep it up right near the end. Good job. Today is kind of a discussion day. Uh, not a lot of math today. It's more of like interesting things in the world that people are doing to increase toughness of composites. So lots of pictures, lots of cool discussion that we'll have today. It's a little bit more of a chill day on this Friday. All right, let's uh, talk about where we had sort of left off. How's the meme today? You guys ever uh, experienced this this phenomena? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how a lot of people end up getting and doing my homework since I give the answer. You know, they have all sorts of crazy results and then they just write the answer at the end or somehow their math magically got them there. Oh, bugs. Yeah. All right. So let's recall where we were. That's not what we want. Scary. All right. So last time we had made a mention that composites generally are quite brittle, and that makes them one of the biggest limitations that composites has is that they're brittle. So people are afraid to use them because easy to crack, so on and so forth. So last time we were talking about toughening mechanisms. And I had kind of made a list here of toughening mechanisms that sort of exist or people are trying to use to make composites tougher. We looked at fiber bridging. We looked at or talked about matrix modifications. Some people have done stitching or z-pinning. So I'll say stitching. Z pin. We'll talk about what this is today. Uh, interleaving, also an interesting phenomenon. And modifying fabric architectures. All right, fiber bridging, we kind of talked about last time, just to remind you what that is. It's this idea that as you're pulling open a composite, and this isn't really something that people are uh, actively trying to do. It's just kind of a phenomenon that occurs in composites. So maybe it, it's not really technically fall in line of like a toughening mechanism. It's more of like a, something that naturally occurs inside composites that helps to toughen them. And we looked at fiber bridging, which is the idea kind of depicted in this picture here. Uh, wow, too big too much is that as you're trying to like rip open this double cantilever beam specimen in this particular instance, you have all these individual like strands and hairs that are kind of in the crack plane that are helping to sort of like keep that composite held together. It's kind of like this Velcro idea, right? So what that leads to is if you're testing this material, you get an R curve that might look something like this here. And the idea is that when we first start the test, let's say at points that look like any of these down here, there's no fiber bridging yet. <laughs> That's the British version of fiber. No fibra. I'll leave it because it's interesting. No fiber bridging yet. I worked with a bunch of guys from uh, from Great Britain on a project actually when I was in graduate school. Like really cool guys, really interesting guys. And they would always say composites and uh, some other weird words like Zed 
for Z and stuff like that in the Z direction. Like, it's just very interesting, like working with these British guys. All right. So anyways, at the very beginning, there's like no fiber bridging. So all these kind of data points here. And that's because when you first start the fracture test, you've got that piece of Teflon that sort of interrupts the formation of the fiber bridges. But as the test progresses, you see that we get sort of toughening that's occurring uh, because these fiber bridging is sort of so, kind of sort of to like take over. And so you get fiber bridging, get fiber bridging until you re reach an equilibrium here, this kind of like flat configuration where you've equilibrated the amount of new fibers that are created relative to the fibers that are sort of being pulled apart as you're propagating this, this crack. All right, so that's fiber bridging. We talked about that last time. I'm not gonna belabor that too much. And you're all experts on it now that you did that homework, right? You could identify that in an R curve. Yes? Suspicious. All right, let's continue with our list then. The next thing I want to talk about is matrix modifications. And so this is the big one where now we're starting to talk about things that people are physically actively trying to do to increase toughness of composites. And that is like making modifications to the matrix material specifically to increase the toughness. All right, so here now let's talk about matrix modifications. All right, and there's a lot of things that you can do to modify the matrix, all right? Let's remind you that epoxy alone Obviously, very low toughness. All right, if you wanted to quantify it, it'd be like a G1C of approximately equal to 100 joules per meter squared, plus or minus. All right, it's like glass. All right, you know that glass, if you just hit it with a baseball bat, it's going to shatter. Right, not very tough. Not like you guys. You guys are tough. All right. Epoxy alone, very toughness, G1C in the 100 joules per meter squared range. All right, that's on par with glass. And this obviously translates to low toughness of the composite. Obviously. All right. Now, if we want to increase the toughness generally of the composite, the best way to do that actually is to try to increase the toughness of the matrix material. And that's because the crack is typically like propagating through the matrix itself. All right. You don't get a crack propagating through the fibers. Well, hardly ever. All right. Usually it's propagating like at the interface between the fibers and the matrix or directly through the matrix itself. All right. So the methods that people have looked at that have been most successful would be something like adding elastomeric materials like rubber particles. This is sometimes called rubber toughening. And in fact, most epoxies that are used in manufacture nowadays have rubber particles like included or they have a thermoplastic phase at like a small percent let's say you have 10 percent thermoplastic uh, to increase the toughness so this is very common now so that's second idea here now is adding a thermoplastic phase all right so thermoplastic reminder is like uh, polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene, um, so polyurethane, polypropylene, uh, peak, which is polyether ether ketone, uh, et cetera, polycarbonate, the, the list goes on. All right, there are many. And that's uh, done because thermoplastics typically have higher toughness than uh, the epoxy itself. So thermoplastics are generally tougher. And you know that from your 429 class when we talked about matrix materials, is that cross, uh, cross-linked thermal setting materials like epoxies are brittle and thermoplastic materials are tough. 
All right. So an example would be something like peak, which has a G1C of approximately 1,000 joules per meter squared. So it's 10 times tougher than epoxy, and that's peak. And peak's not even like the toughest thermoplastic. It's like, I don't know, probably mid-range. Peak is like the Ben Stiller, all right? He's not a great actor, but he's pretty good, all right? He's no Al Pacino, but he's pretty good, all right? Adding a thermoplastic phase to the epoxy can help, uh, and that's because the thermoplastics are tougher. And another thing that you can do, which is dangerous, but could have its place, is reducing cross-link density. In the composite. So what I mean by that is you could add fillers or add other liquid components to the resin mixture such that you're really decreasing like the thermal set density inside of the inside of the material and that leads it to be less brittle but at the cost of other mechanical properties. All right. So most of these Increased toughness. At the cost of stiffness and strength. Okay. This is the case for most materials. You have to make a decision about whether you want your material to be tough or stiff and strong. Usually those things do not go hand in hand. So think about metals. Hopefully you talked about this in your metallurgy class, is that sometimes you need more toughness in a metal. And so you have to incorporate a certain amount of elements to make that alloy more ductile. Okay, so think about like different classes of aluminum. You have aluminum 6061, which is generally a very ductile type of aluminum versus aluminum 7075, that's also pretty good, but even like aluminum 2024 is getting to be quite brittle and, and very like, uh, it doesn't have as much energy absorption, though it is much, much stiffer and much, much stronger. Same thing with aluminum 70, uh, 75. It's very, very strong and stiff, but a little bit more brittle. And it just has to do with the alloy compositions that you have. In relative relation to like aluminum 6061, which has kind of a nice mix of both toughness and strength. So this is true for like all materials. And when we're talking about epoxies, we can start incorporating rubber bits or start incorporating thermoplastics or whatever we want, but it's going to generally like reduce the stiffness and the strength of that material. If you think about including like rubber particles and rubber bits, well, we know from particulate theory that there's a certain amount of modulus reduction from that. Okay. It goes with the Lewis Nielsen approximation, which you talk about in 429. All right. So we know that there are these reductions that exist and it's a trade-off that you have to make, but Usually the trade-off is worth it because most of the time these materials are failing in the fracture anyways, this bit brittle type fracture. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. All right, so let's look at some let's look at some pictures because pictures are cool. First, is a, a rubber toughened epoxy. It's called rubber toughened, uh, but it's actually got a thermoplastic phase. but it resembles what is like a rubber toughened material. All right, so let's pull this in here. I'll show you. This guy, bam! This is a cool picture. Uh, and this is from a girl that I went to graduate school with. She was there at the same time that I was. Uh, her name is Amanda Jones. Uh, I don't know what she's doing these days. I think she's a, a postdoc at Yale now. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, she made this epoxy and she mixed with it a thermoplastic. And the idea is that as this thing cools down and it's starting to solidify, right? You mix this up at high temperature uh, and as it begins to solidify and then you bring it down to a, a cool temperature from uh, room temperature, then these little rubber bits form. 
So here, all this blue stuff here, this is epoxy by itself. So it's this epoxy matrix, which is this diluted digiba, right? Diglycite acetyl ether of bisphenol A. We talked about this. It's EPON828. It's a specific type of that EPON resin that we talked about. And it's cross-linked with an amino or amine hardener, diamino, meaning two amine groups per molecule, diamino uh, <clears throat> molecule. All right, so that's all the blue that you see here. That is the epoxy matrix itself, right? This continuous matrix phase. Inside of that matrix phase are these particles. And so you see these particles here, kind of in gray, and they're thermoplastic particles. This is polybisphenol coepicolarhedron or PBAE for short, it's a very common thermoplastic that's used to toughen epoxy materials. So this is an example picture that Amanda took under the microscope. It's a very nice image of a fracture surface. You can sort of see the hackle marks that are here from the fracture. Kind of a cool little, kind of a cool little image showing a fractured surface of this particular material and the rubber toughened particles inside. Here, each one of these particles is anywhere from 500 nanometers to one micrometer in diameter. Uh, kind of a cool little rubber toughening uh, idea. All right. And so including these rubber bits are useful for increasing the fracture toughness. But like, why is it that including the rubber particles helps you increase the toughness? And there are many reasons why. And I looked for a, a while for like a good figure that kind of illustrated all the benefits that you get from including these rubber toughened particles. And the best image that I found actually comes from Wikipedia. Uh, which is like some guy made this specifically for Wikipedia and posted it on Wikipedia. So uh, good for that guy. All right, Wikipedia, rawr. All right, so uh, let's talk about the mechanisms of rubber toughening. And this picture is just the best picture that I could find is from Wikipedia, so sorry. Sometimes it has its uses. I avoid it when possible, but sometimes. You guys get all your answers there. Suspicious. All right, so here's the idea. It's trying to show all of these particular benefits that you get from including rubber toughened particles. So each one of these like circles is supposed to be some rubber toughened particle, and then the crack is propagating along here, and all these numbers are associated with the various things that you're getting in benefit from including all these rubber particles. All right, so we have things like shear band formation, fracture of rubber particles. So that's here, obviously, if you're fracturing through the rubber particle because it's a higher toughness, you're just going to increase the toughness generally. Uh, same thing here with number six. Uh, number three is rubber stretching. So just kind of pulling this rubber bit, even without it fracturing, is going to require a lot of energy. So toughens up the the material and so on and so forth. There's lots of examples here, lots of different mechanisms that occur. There's crazing, which is kind of a graduate level idea. Plasticity, which you guys can understand is, is associated with a high level of energy absorption. Uh, right, lots of different mechanisms here that help you to increase that toughness of that particular composite by including like this thermoplastic phase or this rubber phase. And you can actually put numbers to the benefits that you get from this. All right, so actual numbers. And this comes from your um, book from the course. Kind of the, uh, the alternate book for the course, I should say. All right, so a lot of numbers here. Let's kind of just talk about this. First, let's look at this rigid TGMDA, which is uh, a disciple of the Jiba. All right. And DDS is this diamino uh, cell phone that's included as the amino uh, hardener. All right, so what you'll see here is that by itself, this is just the epoxy neat by itself, right? Matrix alone, you have a G1C of 70 joules per meter squared. Terrible, all right? Awful, all right? So if we take this epoxy and we have uh softening between the cross links okay so this is uh reducing the cross link density inside of the material uh it can jump up to 460 joules per meter squared but if you start to include something like a ctbn rubber particle which is here you get tremendous increases in the toughness 
up to 5,000 joules per meter squared. So including rubber particles and playing some tricks with the cross-link density of the matrix, you can go from what is 70 joules per meter squared to almost a 100 times increase uh, to get to 5,000 joules per meter squared. All right, that's ridiculous, all right? We're talking about, you know, here is like 80 times the load required, 75 times the load required, basically if you're talking about like work and energy as, as, a, as a load value uh, to, to, to fracture this piece, okay? It's insane, all right? Uh, so that's in the pure matrix alone. And how does that translate to the composites? Well, if you use this matrix inside of a composite, your composite's gonna have a, a toughness in, on the order of 190 joules per meter squared, which is kind of the low end for composites. And again, this is kind of a, uh, a number based on a certain fabric architecture that we have, but you get the general idea. If you include rubber particles here, get up to 1,115. All right, if you then start playing tricks about cross-link density, you get up to 1,730 from 190. Again, like a 10 times increase roughly just by changing uh, the matrix material properties. So a very powerful and potentially useful uh, tool here to incorporate rubber particles or incorporate a thermoplastic phase into the epoxy and almost every single aerospace grade composite that is created now has this rubber toughening inside of it. So all of the, you know, pre-preg that goes into fabricating the, uh, the Boeing 787, all those autoclaved thermal, uh, pre-preg pieces, they all have a thermoplastic toughening phase inside of them, okay? And that's because it just increases the toughness tremendously uh, so that if you have a bird strike or a technician drops a wrench on it or so on and so forth, it really resists cracking and fracture propagation, all right? So this puts some, some numbers to it, okay? All right, so that's matrix modifications. The next major thing that we can talk about for uh, toughening mechanisms inside composites. Where the hell is my mouse? Next thing we might want to talk about is playing tricks with the fabric architecture. All right. So that is stitching or Z pinning or generally rearranging the architecture in some way. So the next mechanism we'll talk about is stitching. All right. And again, this is going to be giving you some toughness increases in the plane by sacrificing some of the properties in the plane. All right. So stitching is pretty obvious, like what it is. Okay. So if you have some composite, uh, which is just dry glass fabric. So this is before resin infusion. You have a glass fabric stack, or it could be carbon fiber stack or, you know, a natural fiber stack, whatever. All right. The idea is you take a needle and thread or something equivalent, like a sewing machine, and you just like sew stuff in here. All right. So here's your stitching. All right. So it can be by hand, sewing machine. Etc. All right. Something where you're incorporating like needle and thread. You know, I feel like uh, Sound of Music right now. So, a needle pulling thread. All right. That's the idea. Usually the stitches are the same material as whatever the fabric is. but not always. It could be a tougher material. Like let's say you use a thermoplastic stitching fiber in a typically glass stack, all right? So I'll say, but not always. And the most common example would be like using a thermoplastic filament and glass fabric or carbon fabric or whatever. All right. Let's look at some examples, pictures. All right. So 
here's pictures and data. Kind of on the left hand side here. You already saw the the fiber bridging in the in the middle there, but and on the left hand side here we have a, a carbon fiber epoxy uh, DCB. So here this is carbon fiber plus epoxy. And stitched in there is either flax or cotton. All right, so you see like flax and cotton stitched into the carbon uh, that makes up sort of the, the, the backbone of this particular piece. Okay, so then you go and you test this and you look at, all right, how do the cotton stitches and the flax stitches vary with our density of stitching? All right, so what they say, the stitch aerial fraction here is how much stitching are they doing inside of the composite in sort of an aerial fashion. And as you include more stitches here for like the flax, you're increasing generally the toughness of this material. All right, uh, looks like the cotton not really doing that much for you. It's a bold strategy, cotton. Let's see how it plays out. Right. Dodgeball, anyone? Dodgeball? Bold strategy, cotton. All right. So might look something like that where you get these stitches included. Now, the danger here, if you're doing this, is that you're going to potentially compromise mechanical integrity of the fibers that are sort of like running in the plane. Okay? So that's, that's the, the danger. All right, so if you're looking at a laminate here and you've got like a bunch of fibers that are kind of going in this way and then, you know, maybe there are some that are kind of coming across the plane, whatever that look like this and you've got a bunch of these fibers that are here. And now I start including these like big stitches that are kind of just like moving through this fabric. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to end up like displacing a bunch of fibers like to the side. Okay. So locally, in and out of the plane, right around the stitch, you have a reduction in strength and stiffness. That can be bad. All right, it's like stress concentration. All right, or in these like 90 degree layers, you could rupture or break the fibers. That's real bad because now those fibers, which are typically responsible for carrying the load or carrying the strength or uh, you know, have the elastic properties that sort of make this composite what it is. If you start breaking fibers, all right, GG, like it's over. You got to stop doing what you're doing because that's, that's bad business. All right. So you have to be mindful when you're doing like the stitching that you're not compromising the mechanical integrity at, at that sort of level. All right. So that's the danger of stitching. Uh, similar to stitching is another idea called Z-pinning. And it's very similar in style, except for stitching, you have just like one continuous strand. So here, this is like one continuous strand. And Z-pinning, basically, you just like put dowels, individual dowels, like into the, into the composite. All right. So similar to stitching. but you're sort of like incorporating individual pins or dowels. And I'll say individual pins and dowels. And it's different than stitching, which just basically uses like one piece of continuous thread to kind of get everything together. All right. So let's see what that might look like. All right, so here is an example of incorporating. Is that you lay out your fabric mat, you put a bunch of pins over the top of that mat that you wanna put into your fabric, and then you take like an ultrasonic welding gun and force them in through like this sonication method. All right, so here you've got a bunch of 
pins that are laying over the top of the composite laminate. You can't really like force them in because it's like a solid fabric. You need some some like ultrasonic gun to get them in there. Okay. Uh, and so that's what's happening here in um, picture number two. So you've got this like ultrasonic um, gun, basically. You just like put on top of the stitches and force them into the laminate. All right. So what that looks like if you actually look at the cross section. is this and the image here may be a little bit uh low quality but you sort of understand the idea here's this pin that's been inserted all right so this is like the what would be like the z direction okay and here's like the x direction so you've got this pin that's kind of been inserted into the thickness and you see that like interruption or the distortion of the in-plane fibers that i'm talking about so here's like an example of a fiber toe that maybe has like three thousand fibers in it and you see, like, how significantly it's been displaced. All right. So locally in that region, all of the fibers that would have been there to carry load in the plane, they gone. All right. The pin is useful, yes, in that it stops, like, cracks from propagating in this direction. Okay. So it's going to interrupt any cracks that are propagating through the material once it hits that pin. But... Uh, annoying in the fact that you basically lose all the mechanical properties associated with the in-plane uh, load carrying capability of that particular structure. All right. So, you know, it's really this drawback, like I've kind of been hammering home. All right. So here's obviously your epoxy phase. And then all these, like, all these guys here are like the fibers, obviously, kind of like understand that at this point. All right. So there's a cross section after a pin has been inserted into a, a like a, a composite material and it's been fabricated. All right. So there's some additional pictures on on here that kind of show what I'm talking about. I I like this particular picture in in general because it sort of shows a double cantilever beam specimen with a bunch of pins in it and sort of what happens at at that pin. And then you get like these resin pockets around there as well. So again, here's a double cantilever beam specimen. We're pulling it up and down. This person was pinning them by putting these pins in these like discrete locations and pulling this double cantilever beam specimen open and seeing like what happens how much increase in toughness do i get etc uh, and so what happens is in the plane because you're pushing this pin through you get all this displacement and distortion of the fibers which can be really bad for the mechanical properties all right so that's what it looks like sort of in theory and then this is what it looks like in practice and you know the difference between theory and practice i've talked about this before they're the same in theory but not in practice Okay. So here's from above. And again, you see the pin going in here and sort of displacing all of the fibers out to the side. So locally, the mechanical performance of the composite in that location in the plane is terrible. All right. It's good for resisting fracture, but yikes, you're, uh, you're really compromising the, the properties of the composite in that location. All right. So hopefully you get the idea of Z pinning and stitching and why there's potential drawbacks there. All right. Now, let's continue with another tech toughening mechanism that's a little different, and that's called interleaving. And interleaving is a really good idea and is commonly done when you don't have a lot of, like, shear that you're expecting on your material. It's only, like, uh, in-plane loading and possibly, like, some indentation or out-of-plane uh, dropping a tool or something. And with interleaving, what you're doing is you're adding a thin layer of thermoplastic between the individual laminate layers. All right. Add a thin, tough uh, layer between laminate layers. The idea here is that you you understand that cracks will typically propagate between laminate layers. So if you got a stack that's like 090, 090, 0, 
typically the crack is going to like propagate between those zero and 90 degree layers. All right. It's just the way that this crack propagation typically works. So if you want to slow that down or arrest that, you can put a very tough thermoplastic material, let's say like a polyurethane, very thin polyurethane layer at that interface. Okay. So, so usually a thermoplastic. And most common is polyurethane. Some form of polyurethane. There are many forms of polyurethane. There are many like it. This one is mine. All right. Uh, thickness, usually about one to 200 micrometers thick. All right. So, the diameter of a human hair is about 40 microns. Gives you an idea. So one micron is like 140th the diameter of a human hair. 200 microns is about five times the thickness of a human hair. So that's the type of thickness we're talking about for incorporating an interleave between laminate layers. So now if you incorporate an interleave and you start doing like your DCB testing again, you might see something that looks like this. All right. So here we have a, a couple of different types of interleaves. All right, but the general idea is the same. You're looking here at a double cantilever beam specimen before testing. And here you would be loading it in this general direction. So a mode one opening. And you have this vinyl ester resin, glass fiber, vinyl ester resin. Uh, the pre-crack is incorporated. Uh, and the idea here is that between the layers that you're trying to crack open, you have this additional what they call a thermoplastic veil all right this is the interleaf of interest okay and for this particular example they tested two different types of interleaves pa a polyamide which is like nylon it's the alternate name for nylon pa you might see it as pa6 which is nylon 6 or pet polyethylene tetraphthalene uh, which is a, a more common thermoplastic But the result is the same, is that you see when they fracture this thing open or pull this thing open, you have these tendrils or these fibrils that exist because the thermoplastic is trying to like hang on between the two different layers. And so instead of fracturing through the generally brittle matrix phase, what you're trying to accomplish here is you're fracturing through the thermoplastic phase, which gives you a, a, an incredibly increased toughness, usually 10 to 50 times increase in toughness, right? All right, so that's good up to 10 to 50 X increase in G one C. But again, it comes with the cost, right? And that cost is that you're incorporating a thermoplastic layer that doesn't have any fibers in it, right? Meaning you're decreasing the volume fraction definitely of your material, which we know decreases the strength, the stiffness in the plane, uh, bending properties, everything. All right, so it comes at cost. of in-plane properties, again. Because lowers the volume fraction. All right, if you're incorporating some thermoplastic layer that doesn't have any fibers in it, well, you're decreasing the, the volume fraction, generally, of that piece. All right. So that's interleaving. Honestly, it's not done all that often at the highest levels, like uh, wind sector, energy sector. It's more of a niche thing that might be useful in cheaper applications, like the marine industry does it from time to time. So canoes and boat hulls and things like that, we're using cheap epoxy and cheap therm uh, cheap glass fiber materials. So kind of continuous woven strand mats are very common in the marine industry. So uh, thermoplastics can sometimes be incorporated as like a thin layer between them to increase this toughness, all right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a solidly thick piece. It could just kind of be like a, this strand mat of like thermoplastic fiber, all right? So that's where you might see interleaves. Next toughening mechanism is generally just changing the fabric architecture, all right? So we got to talk about fabric architectures.
And we've talked a little bit about fabric architectures in the past. Uh, so that would be a reminder what the fabric architecture might be is mostly we've talked about unidirectional unidirectional fabric in this class. Which remember unidirectional fabric kind of speaks for itself. It's just, you know, a layer of material that only has fibers in one direction. All right, so this like unidirectional material, only fibers in this like one direction. And this is how we make our laminates. We stack these unidirectional layers on top of each other. You know, you get it at this point. If not, you, what are you doing? Do not pass in my class if you don't know that. All right, mostly we talk about unidirectional fabric, but there are other types. And we've talked a lot about other two-dimensional architectures, which are things like plane weave and twill weave and satin weave. And so we'll characterize them by directionality of the architecture. So 2D might be something like a plane weave or twill weave or satin weave. So hopefully we all kind of remember what that is. A plane weave is like this sort of checkerboard kind of idea where here's the warp weft. Uh, twill is like uh, something like this. Similar idea, except we go like two over, two under, two over, two under, two over, two under, two over, two under, so on and so forth. All right. Uh, satin weave is similar, except we go like four over, one under, four over, one under, something like this. Something like this. All right, you get the general idea. Satin weave looks something like that. So there's your other types of weaves, and these generally are two-dimensional architectures, meaning it's kind of like contained in the plane. The other modification, and this is kind of a, a hot area right now, so the last 10 or so years, has been investigating what are called 3D woven composites. And Three-dimensional woven architectures are crazy. There are some crazy types. There are many crazy varieties. But most common is orthogonal weave. We'll talk a little bit more about woven fabrics next week. Um, but... A 3D weave can be very helpful, and the most common is the orthogonal weave. So let's look at how those two compare. And we'll, let's look at what a you know, plane weave might look like versus what this 3D orthogonal weave might look like. your plane weave versus your orthogonal weave. So this is plain. And you see this typical structure where it's like uh, under one, over one, under one, over one, so on and so forth. All right, so like the red and the green are kind of this crisscross pattern. It's kind of like how your shirt is made. And then the three-dimensional composite has this additional through thickness toe that's incorporated into the uh, fabrication, the architecture process. And so this is an additional through thickness. toe. And the idea here you can see is very apparent is that you're trying to replicate like the stitching and the Z pinning behavior, but with as minimal amount of in plane fiber distortion as possible. minimal distortion of in-plane fibers. Okay, so the idea here is that you have a loom that 
weaves all of these things together in an automated fashion. If you guys have ever seen like automated looms work, they're freaking amazing. They're amazing in innovations of engineering. Okay. So you got this like three dimensional weave loom that's creating this three dimensional fabric architecture for you. You're maintaining like continuity of your in plane toes. So you see this like red toe here is like totally undisturbed, nothing over and under it. Same thing with the green guys that are down here that are kind of like uh, in the opposite direction of the red guys. They're totally undisturbed in that plane, meaning that they don't have like this over and under that they have to worry about. And then through all of that, you have these additional like Z toes that are sort of weaving and interwoven inside of the fabric together. All right. So this is what it looks like sort of in theory. I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, and by the way, this is your orthogonal weave. And this is a three-dimensional architecture. All right. So what this looks like in reality is something like this. This is a 3D woven glass fabric, kind of looking down where each one of these things is an individual toe. All right. So like this guy that's running here, he's an individual toe. You can sort of see the, the toes that are across it sort of running underneath here. And then the Z toes, which are moving over the fabric are kind of here. So hopefully you sort of see those guys here. And you still sort of see these guys coming across the top as part of like this over under sort of stitching. All right. So you see those individual uh, layers that are there. And so this is an actual 3D orthogonal weave. All right. And so what that tries to do is it tries to arrest crack growth by just having those fibers be there right so it's it's trying to mimic what the stitches and the z pins do but really trying not to distort the architecture in any way all right so this comes from the phd dissertation of yours truly and this is how the Z toes work to deflect delaminations or stop crack growth. All right, so this was an impacted composite. It was impacted out of plane. And you see what's happening here is you have these delaminations that wanted to grow, wanted to grow, wanted to grow, but all of a sudden they hit this big ass Z pin. All right, they hit this big ass Z toe, right? This is what it's called when it's through the thickness is the Z toe. And so what happens is the delamination like deflects downward here and says like, I got nowhere to go. I can't go through this pin. I got to go somewhere else. And it takes a lot of energy for that delamination to like deflect downwards like that. Uh, also, if you're trying to just like pull this thing open naturally, like a double cantilever beam specimen, like you'd have to pull all those fibers out. I mean, God damn, that would take so much more energy than not having them there. Okay, so what happens is like the delamination size, the opening of the delamination between the layers is really restricted because you have the Z directional fiber that's like stopping it from like opening up as you impact it or as the crack tries to propagate, so on and so forth. So it's like very powerful mechanism here. But again, it, it comes at the cost of in-plane properties. So it doesn't cost you as much as, let's say, stitching and z-pinning would, right? All right. So that's it. There's some numbers on the last couple of slides that sort of show you approximately the G1C and G2C values of, of NEAT and uh, composite materials fabricated with these modifications. So some numbers that are associated? What do each of these mechanisms do to increase your toughness? And what's the, the quantitative amount? OK, we're all scientists, right? We're all numbers people. You want to know how much does it actually go up? What are the numbers, baby? Show me the data. Show me the money. Show me the data. Rawr. That's what Donald Trump says all the time. Show me the data. OK, sorry, my political uh, coming is out there. All right, <laughs> show me the data. I don't think he's ever said that in his life. All right, so here we go. Neat resin systems, so no composite involved. That means the architecture, not important here. Fiber, not important here. But the idea here is that 
these resin systems have various hardeners associated. All right, so Dejiba plus a different type of hardener. And you can see that even changing the hardener alone can change what is the crosslink density and change the toughness of the material. So when you're talking about matrix modifications through crosslink density, you're talking about relatively minor changes in the toughness, still relatively low. When you start adding rubber toughened particles, okay, so now you're rubber toughening with various particulates. These are trade names, HX206 and F185. Bam! Oh man, that thing just shoots up to the moon, right? Getting a oh, hundred times increases for that second rubber toughened material. All right. If you have a thermoplastic resin by itself, all right, so this is no longer an epoxy, but Altem, this is a polyether imid material. Uh, those thermoplastics alone generally have pretty high toughnesses in like the 3,000 joules per meter squared range. So if you want to make a composite out of thermoplastic matrix, you're probably going to be pretty well off. All right, now let's compare that to composites that we fabricate. All right, so all epoxy resins here with different types of glass and different general architectures. All right, we see that we have glass, we have carbon, we have epoxy that's unmodified and a variety of different architectures, but kind of regardless of the architecture, you still see that the G1C values are in the range of like 100 to 1,000, all right? Not that great. But once you start adding or creating composites out of thermoplastic, all right, well, now you get some increases, though it's not tremendous, 800 to 1,500. And if you start including rubber toughened epoxy inside your composite, that's kind of the money maker. That's the sweet spot. So what you'll notice is that a lot of people in industry, when they're making composites at the highest level, so aerospace grade, wind energy, vehicles, uh, vehicles not as much, but um, aerospace vehicles, I'm talking here, not cars, they're starting to use these rubber toughened epoxies. It costs you some in-plane properties, but the fracture properties are amazing. All right, so that's it. Hopefully you learned something interesting today. A little more qualitative discussion rather than quantitative, not a lot of math, but whatever. I hope you liked it. All right, that's it for today. Have a good weekend. See you guys on Monday.